Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to meet with us today. Um, my name is Egon Rangini. I'm the one of the science and technology advisor for uh, for the next. And um, yeah, and today, so I like to I like to focus on the the new solution, which is called single cell gene expression flexes. Essentially, a solution that allows you to um, fix samples in uh, formaldehyde and then store the samples and, and run them even months later. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility, um, no pun intended, I guess. Um, and I'm um, going to talk about that. And I will also cover a couple of more things, uh, just a couple of things at the very beginning. And uh, um, oh, one more thing, I, I'd be more than happy to share this presentation with you. And if you have any question, feel free to ask me or add, it in the, uh, add your question in the chat and uh, make sure that um, we can answer your question. So um, that's, that's just to show you uh, the three main platforms that we have available at 10X and what we've been developing to um, puzzle the complexity of biology. So today we're going to focus on the Chromium platform or at least a couple of solutions um, for, on the Chromium platform that is for single cell genomics. Um, but keep in mind, again, that we have uh, our um, spatial transcriptomics platform uh, called Visium, and then it's for all transcriptome analysis um, in FFP or fresh frozen tissue sections. And last week, we started shipping the uh, new in situ analysis platform that is called Xenium. And that will allow you to do uh, to interrogate the expression level of hundreds of target genes in FFP or fresh frozen tissue sections um, and achieve subcellular uh, resolution. Now back to single cell. Um, I always like to say that we are extremely proud to, to see that this technology has been used in, uh, in more than 3,700 publications and, um, and is at the same time really super excited to, to witness the, um, type, the, the research that has been made possible to, thanks, to, thanks to 10X. Um, now when we look at a 10X workflow, single cell or pretty much any workflow, we should say. Um, we always look at what we call a beginning to end solution, be beginning to end workflow, because that's because all reagents that you need to make a sequencing ready library, um, those reagents are already provided in, in the kit um, that we, 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 we sell. And so when you start a single cell experiment, all you need to do is to prepare a high quality single cell suspension or single nuclear suspension if you are profiling nuclei. And then, we also have a pretty broad um, range of, um, well, I say, uh, bioinformatics uh, tools to, um, um, to, to essentially run data analysis and to visualize the data. And those, the, those tools are um, um, available for you um, for free. Um, I would also like to um, emphasize that we have a cloud analysis um, solution that is, uh, allows you to essentially run our single cell pipeline for free using our clouds. Um, you don't need any bioinformatic expertise as is a GUI interface, so really you need to, um, all you need to do is to create an account with us and you'll be able to run Cell Ranger in a matter of hours. Now, when uh, we consider those 3,700 plus publication, um, now we know that the majority of those papers have been generated using human or mouse samples, but we do also have solutions that, well, they, we, do, we also have a lot of papers um, that have been published or generated using non-traditional model organisms, and that ranges from plants to insects to um, non-human primates um, to um, um, fishes. Um, not sure about elephants here or octopus, but um, maybe one day. Um, and when it comes to sample type compatibility, here is where really we can profile um, a large variety, or we can start rather from a large variety of sample types. And so we know we can start from single cell or cell in culture. We can start from single nuclei or isolated nuclease. We can start from blood samples and isolated cells. Uh, we can start from fresh tissue or uh, uh, snap frozen tissue. Uh, we can now also fix tissue in PFA, in formaldehyde. This is actually what I'm going to talk about today in more details. And then we have this uh, very exciting uh, new protocol that uh, will enable us to um, essentially generate single cell data starting from FFP tissue blocks. It's super exciting and I'm going to show you some slides later. But before we get there, um, I just want to give you an example of how the technology uh, has been used in the field. And uh, I chose this uh, recent paper, which was published in Nature Neuroscience a couple of months ago. 
And uh, it's a study in which the authors wanted to kind of better characterize um, the, this condition called frontotemporal dementia. And, um, and, and so to do that, they, they obtained pa um, brain uh, samples from patients with uh, frontotemporal dementia, and they profiled uh, more than 430,000 nuclei uh, using the single cell gene expression solution. Um, and um, in, a, in a nutshell, they were able to identify a subpopulation of um, astrocytes that are called GM, that stands for gray matter astrocyte, um, that were particularly enriched in the, um, in, the, uh, in the patient compared to controls. And, they, and the authors found that those, uh, those astrocytes might be associated with the dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier. And so it's, this is a really nice example that shows you how you can use a single cell approach to, to interrogate the heterogeneity of a very complex samples um, and really start um, getting very uh, impactful and um, meaningful information out of a, a complex sample such as this, uh, those brain uh, tissues. Now, in this paper, the authors provide nuclei. We know that isolating nuclei from um, tissue can be challenging and very time consuming. Um, and so a few, few months ago, we released a nuclear isolation kit, which is compatible with a large variety of tissue uh, types. Frozen tissue, um, in particular, it also works with fresh tissue. Um, and, uh, and all you need to do here is use three to 50 milligrams of tissue um, and have a benchtop centrifuge. And in about one hour, you will isolate high quality nuclei that can be imme pretty much immediately run on our assay. Um, really, this kit is intended to um, generate high quality nuclei with no optimization or very little optimization. And uh, everything that you need for nuclear isolation is part of the kit, including the RNAs inhibitor that's already included in the kit. And so to show you, for instance, how we use this, uh, the, the kit in-house, um, here we looked at four different um, tumor samples. Uh, so we isolated nuclei from fresh frozen, or well, snap frozen, I should say, um, tissues. Uh, and so we have an, ova uh, um, an ovarian cancer tumor here, um, uh, ovarian cancer here. We have a, a kidney cancer here, uh, melanoma, and also we have a pancreatic cancer here. And as you can see, those, two, those four different types of cancer really separate well um, or cluster um, well um, apart from each other. And, uh, and, uh, and the, we, are, we were also able to retain uh, la, um, you know, the immune cells, and so not only the, um, cancer um, type specific cells, but also the immune cell population is very well represented. And here we have another example, um, which we use nuclei for our, as input material for our uh, multi-omassy, which allows you to simultaneously measure gene expression and profile the uh, region of accessible chromatin. And again, we, were, uh, we isolated nuclei from a kidney uh, tumor sample. Uh, this was a human sample. And we immediately loaded the, kid, uh, the, the, the nuclei on the, on the instrument, generated the data, and um, we were able to identify the main components of the kidney. But what I would like to show you, what, uh, what I think is really important here is we were able to retain a large percentage of podocyte. And, I'm a kidney guy, so I really love to see this data because we know that kid I know that podocytes are really large cells, um, and so sometimes it's challenging to capture those cells. But now that we have nuclei, the cell size is no longer an issue, and so we can really have a beautiful representation of those um, cell types. Now, very briefly, the kit also works on um, fresh tissue. So here we see a. Um, a sample, um, it was a spleen sample, I believe, um, um, fresh and frozen. There is a very good overlap between the two clusters. My recommendation is if you want to run um, frozen t uh, fresh tissue, um, test the kit first. And, um, and the, the differences in c that we see in the cell population between the two conditions, those are essentially due to the fact that some cell types don't like being uh, frozen. And so that's also something to, think, to, to keep in mind when you plan your experiment. If you want to retain a particular uh, class of cell, like let's say neutrophils, that would be better. It would be better if you use fresh tissue instead of frozen tissue. And a question that you might be asking is, well, okay, I, I'm profiling nuclei instead of whole cells. What type of information I'm missing? Well, the truth is for the many samples, a uh, uh, vast majority of samples, I should say, you don't lose any information, actually. Um, and that's because, true, you, you capture less RNA, and so you will see less genes per cell, for instance, but the biological information is retained, and so you will still be able to identify the same population of cells with pretty much the same um, 
uh, proportions. Um, and this is PBNC data, but there are also papers on, done on cancer, so uh, even more, more um, complex uh, samples. Now, we know that working with um, fresh tissue, fresh, fresh cells also present many challenges, and this slide doesn't necessarily represent all possible situations, but I think it does a good job um, summarizing the three most common scenarios. Um, and so we know that, for instance, you, you might have samples uh, available outside the regular business hours, or you might want to, let's say, collect samples over multiple time points for a because you are running a longitudinal study, and then ideally you want to submit those samples to, um, at, the same, uh, to the same, at the same time to, the, to, to your um, genomic score. Um, or definitely there are tissue cells that might um, degrade very quickly, and so what we want to do is to preserve or block the degradation, preserve the biology, block the degradation as soon as possible. And then there could be logistic uh, constraints. So for instance, again, you are submitting samples to your core or you are receiving samples from a collaborator. And so to tackle those challenges and provide a better, uh, better solutions, um, recently we launched a kit which was called Single Cell um, Fixed RNA Profiling. Now it's called Single Cell Gene Expression Flex. So, uh, be mentioning, I will mention the name FLEX. And as Sandra mentioned, FLEX is not compatible with the Chromium controller. It is compatible with the Chromium X series instrument. So you will need to um, work with the core um, when running this, uh, uh, this assay. So the, what you can do with FLEX is to collect your samples. Then you can fix your samples in 4% formaldehyde plus couple of components we sell with the kit, but 4% formaldehyde is the final um, concentration for the fixative. And then you can store your single cell suspension or single nuclear suspension for up to six months at minus 80 degrees. So that basically you can preserve the biological state of your samples really no matter when you collect them or where you collect them from. And so that's really what gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and for this uh, particular uh, um, solution, we use a probe-based chemistry in which we use, essentially, we have more than 55,000 set of probes, set of probe pairs, um, or probe pairs, I should say. Um, those probes have been designed to detect all annotated isoform of a particular genes, and in total, we detect more than 18,000 coding genes. So that's essentially will cover the entire um, the entire transcriptome, minus some genes that we didn't include because really we didn't um, add any anything or any useful information. Now, because of the probe-based strategy, uh, what we see is a significantly higher sensitivity with this kit compared to the traditional three prime chemistry or the five prime chemistry, actually, the data is pretty much the same. Um, and then because of probe-based chemistry, we can now also reduce the minimum recommended sequencing depth to just 10,000 read uh, pairs per cell. So when you sequence those libraries, you will be able to save some money also on, on the sequencing side. And what I'm showing you here, those are not cherry pick data. We see this uh, trend across pretty much all samples that we tested. Um, and now this, um, um, this trend also has been confirmed in the field um, by a, a couple of laboratories, I would say. So this is one. Um, and it's a bioarchive paper from um, Luciano Martellotto and Jasmine Plummer. Uh, Jasmine Plummer used to be a Cedar Sane, now she is a San Jude. And then so in this, uh, in this manuscript, um, or I should say in the first part of the manuscript, the, those authors compare the flex chemistry against the three prime chemistry on the same sample. And they found that the flex chemistry could detect more than twice the number of transcripts compared to three prime. And importantly, they also had a better detection of, of um, lowly expressed genes. And uh, as an example, they, they showed the, um, the expression of the top 19 um, transcription factor. So that is really um, you know, the advantage. You are basically now, if you use Flex, you're now you're using the, by far the most sensitive chemistry that, that we have available. Um, we have also similar data on five prime, and actually this is five prime data on nuclei isolated from frozen tissue. Um, the nuclei were isolated using the uh, nuclear isolation kit and nuclei were fixed and then profiled with flex. And again, as you see here, this is, mm, there is a significant increase in sensitivity um, 
compared to the five prime chemistry. And in terms of the data quality, uh, now if we look at the fraction raising cell, which essentially measure the um, background of the assay, again, we get a higher fraction reading cells with flex, which shows you again a better data quality overall. Uh, now, the, the last piece of data I want to show you is a comparison that a, an independent lab um, just generated, and they compared our chemistry against the PARS uh, Evercode V2 chemistry. And again, they found the same sample, so this was human PBMCs. They found a significantly higher sensitivity with flex compared to the V2 chemistry from PARS. Um, and again, so that's to say with flex, really, you have an unmatched sensitivity, so you can get more genes, get more data, better understanding of biology, and that is achieved at a significantly lower sequencing depth. Now, in terms of sample types, um, as it was um, mentioned before, because this is probe-based chemistry, we have a set of probes, and those are available for a human or mouse sample. Now, when it comes to the sample type compatibility, um, here is where, really, we can fix a lot of different sample types. And to be honest with you, I haven't found a sample type, at least in the ma mammalian realm, that we can fix. Um, Probably there is something we cannot fix. Um, if you find something, please let me know. But um, we have protocols for the protocols that we can use to fix cells, uh, nuclei. We can fix tissue, uh, fresh or frozen. I have a slide later that I can show you, but essentially here what you'll be doing is to um, collect your tissue, chop or mince your tissue, um, fix it in the fixative, in the uh, fixation buffer, and then that tissue can be stored at four degrees for seven days. Um, then you'll need to isolate a single cell. Once you isolate the cells, those cells can be stored for months, again, at minus 80 degrees. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and then we can, I'll show you later, but we, we have a protocol to do single cell RNA sequencing starting from FFP blocks. And so one important thing that we wanted to make sure is that, well, now we fix tissue or we, we fix cells, we leave the cells at minus 80 degrees for, let's say, up to six months. How does the cell population um, uh, ratio changes, uh, change if, if it changes? And well, actually, it doesn't. So really, regardless of the length of uh, uh, fixation or the temperature, um, the relative proportion of cell population is not impacted. Now, here, I what I would say is it's recommended to, f to uh, store samples at minus 80. That is better than storing samples at minus 20. So if you, if you can choose, always store samples at minus 80. And in terms of the tissue, so here we um, took a human uh, column tissue sample. We fixed it. So we chopped it. We fixed it. And then we isolated the uh, we isolated single cells, and as you can see here, we were able to identify different classes of immune cells, and then column specific cell types, such as the goblet cell that we have here, um, some myofibroblast, um, a tiny population, or maybe actually to be more here or uh, enteric, um, sorry, no, tiny population of enteric neural neural crest cells and mast cells. Those this is a very tiny population here. Now the flex. Solution is also a multi-omic solution in the sense that you can simultaneously measure gene expression and profile the expression level of cell surface protein by labeling cells with oligoconjugated antibodies from bioagent. Uh, is the total sick B, uh, as in Bravo, um, antibodies. A um, couple of things that you need to keep in mind. One is um, you will need to fix the, well, you need to label the cells after fixing them. Um, Sorry, the other way around. You need to label the cell before fixing, the, before fixing them. So you first label the cell and then you fix them. Uh, and then some ports will need to be run in a single plex format, not in a multiplex format. I'll, show, I'll talk about multiplex in a second. Before showing you that, so we're also working on a protocol that will enable uh, intracellular staining. That is not available yet, um, but my understanding is that it will be available uh, fairly soon and I'll make sure that I'll communicate this information um, when, when, this is, when this protocol is gonna be available. Now, multiplexing, this is the other, or one of the other great things about this solution now. So we can multiplex samples and run multiple samples in the same um, channel of a microfluidic chip uh, without using any 
without labeling cells with oligoconjugated antibodies or oligoconjugated lipid molecules. So in a typical cell hashing experiment, you will need to label cells with oligotagged antibodies and then combine them. Well, here we don't need to do anything of that. That's because we included a unique barcode to each set of probes. And uh, by leveraging the information of this barcode, during data analysis, we can demultiplex these samples. And so here the advantage are, first of all, we don't need to buy antibodies anymore. Second, we don't need to decide up front which sample we want to pull together. Um, with Flex, you simply pull together the uh, samples in the, in the way that makes most sense for your experiment, not when you start the workflow, but when you, uh, sorry, not when you, um, not when you, um, not when you collect the, your samples, but when you start the workflow. So technically, you have up to six months to decide whether or not you want to combine samples. And so that's the other great advantage. Um, and when you do combine samples, you can pull together up to 16 different samples in the same channel and target up, up to 120,000 cells per channel. Um, a chip here has eight channels, and so a full chip will allow you to, tar to recover a million and 24,000 cells per, per run. Uh, and of course, when, when you multiplex samples, so you, is where you also are going to start saving money. I, I'll show you a slide later anyway. Now, here we want to show you that when you multiplex samples, essentially there is no batch effect due to multiplexing. Um, we profiled 112,000 um, cells from a, um, a mouse spleen, uh, and we split the, the initial pool into 16 different uh, um, uh, with initial, initial sample is into 16 different pools. And again, as you can see here, the, the UMAP projection are essentially uh, identical. And so really, there is no batch effect. And in here, we run this um, easy assay um, to essentially provide an idea again of how this uh, kit can be flexible and, how can, and, and the sensitivity of this kit. So I'm not going to show you any um, groundbreaking biology, um, because this is a very well characterized assay. And so it's an assay in which you will be activating T cells by incubating um, your, uh, resting T cells with um, beads, con uh, Dyna beads conjugated with anti CD28 and anti CD3 antibodies. So you do that and resting T cells become activated. So we had um, two independent um, donors, um, PBNC donors. We stimulated these cells for up to two hours and then included two controls, um, a T0 and a T equal to ours. And so we had a total of 16 samples. And we were able to pull those samples together and run them in just one, one channel. And then we looked, for, looked at marker for um, activation, T cell activation. So we started with FOS. There is pretty much no expression um, in the controls. But then the expression already is, uh, is already um, detectable after five minutes after the initial uh, after the stimulation, and it peaks around 30 to 60 minutes, I guess. C CD69 is another marker for um, T cell, early marker for T cell activation. Um, the expression is very low in the controls, and then it peaks around 60 to 90 minutes as we would be expecting. And finally, VISTA, this is a new checkpoint marker. Um, expression peaks around 60 to 90 minutes, and the expression is very low, as expected, in the, in the control. So again, I'm not showing you any groundbreaking biology. This is a very, very well characterized assay. But I'm hoping that this gives you an idea of what you can do with this kit if you are collecting samples over multiple time points. Now you can collect them, you can fix them. And essentially, you don't, once cells or samples are fixed, you don't worry anymore about cell viability. Because samples have been fixed, have been stabilized, and so um, you, we don't need to worry about you know, keeping samples alive anymore. So this, um, this is a slide that perhaps gives you an idea of what you can do with the different samples. Um, again, and we have protocols, so you don't need to develop, optimize any fixation protocol or protocol for fixation. So if you start with cells or nuclei, you can fix them, store them, and then store them and manage safety for up to six months. If you start with tissue, so now we can decide whether maybe we want to dissociate the tissue into single cell. Let's say maybe you want to do fax, and then we can fix those cells, store them. We can isolate nuclei using nuclear isolation kit, fix the nuclei, store the nuclei. Or we can chop means the tissue, fix the tissue, store it for uh, seven days, four degrees, um, and then isolate cells afterward. 
um, and store those cells. And if we have frozen tissue, uh, again, you can decide to isolate nuclei, fix the nuclei, store them, or you can chop means the tissue, fix the tissue, store it, isolate the cells. So it's really a lot of flexibility that you now you have. Uh, now, there are a couple of considerations to keep in mind when we work with fixed um, samples. First of all is the number of cells or nuclei that we want to start with. Because there are some washing steps after fixation and um, after the hyb step, hybridization step, it is recommended to start with at least 300,000 cells or 500,000 nuclei. If you start with tissue, it's a good idea to start with 25 milligrams of tissue. Sample dissociation, if you do dissociate the tissue and you want to keep the tissue alive, let's say there is single cells, um, high viability is critical for, uh, in order to get high quality data, but if you fix the tissue, well, that's no longer a concern. Tissue is, fi is fixed, and so we don't worry anymore about viability. Um, now, when you fix the tissue, uh, I, I mentioned the um, fixative is for, final concentration is 4% formaldehyde. Uh, you will also need to use a sample prep kit that we provide. It's very inexpensive, but it contains a couple of components that you need to add to the um, fix, uh, fixation buffer. So it's, it's not just 4% um, formaldehyde, it's that plus what we provide with the kit. And uh, when you count your cells um, post fixation, strongly, strongly recommend it to use fluorescent. That's because um, if you do use tripan blue and you have some debris, um, you might have some false positive. So you or you you might the tripan blue might uh, see debris as a cells, and so you your your cell count might be off. So really strongly recommended to use, um, for instance, setinium or modimer one when counting fixed samples. Now, to this uh, um, protocol here again is. It's, I keep saying it is super exciting because it's almost incredible where we can run single cell starting from an FFP blocks, but we can. Um, and um, in a nutshell, and the protocol is available. So if you scan this QR code here, you can download the protocol or just send me an email and I'll send you the protocol. Uh, so in a nutshell, what you'll be doing is to cut a couple of um, curls or scrolls of your FFP blocks. Um, and then dissociate the tissue, isolate single cells, and profile the cell with the, um, uh, with the flex chemistry. We have now two different um, tissue dissociation protocol. One uses a um, gentle max, and so you will need to have access to that machine. Plus, you also need to use uh, Miltani reagents. There are a couple of, um, there is a kit that will need to be used. Um, but then now we also have a manual dissociation protocol that does not require the gentle max. Um, this protocol was actually released last week, and um, I've been told that it's more robust than using the gentle max. So if you are starting right now, my re recommendation is to use the manual dissociation protocol. Now, this data here was generating using the Miltani kit because it was released uh, before we, uh, we actually released the, uh, the manual protocol, but it shows you that um, we cut two scrolls, um, 50 micron each, so it's not much, out of, F, of the FFP blocks. Um, this is a lung cancer sample. Um, and we were able to identify different classes of immune cells, again, um, lung-specific cells and those um, cancer cells here. Um, there is, I just want to show you an example of what happens if things don't go really well. So here you have a human pancreas sample. Um, again, is really nice to see good quality data from pancreas. It, that's, it's a very RNA-rich tissue. Um, if you collect it, fix it immediately, um, or embed it immediately in this case um, in, the, in FFP, then you can really get beautiful data. Uh, this is a, an example of a poor um, sample, that are what we call failed samples. Um, I would not uh, focus too much on the confidently mapped reading cell. The difference is not staggering here. Uh, but the compl library complexity is. So here we, we detect only not even 100 genes per cell, not 100 UMI per cell. And as you can see here, we don't really get a nice separation of those different cell populations, what I would call a bouquet, rather than a different, uh, than different uh, a cluster separation. And so um, that is what, um, you know, uh, if, if a sample fails, is that what might happen? But uh, so far we tested about 30 samples, 30 different blocks, and more samples have been tested as we speak. 
Um, you might also wonder what happened when we compare the FFP protocol with the CHOP means, uh, the regular protocol. Um, and um, remarkably, those two protocols uh, yield very similar data. And I say remarkably because getting good quality data from an FFP block can be, I mean, it's, it, it's almost incredible. So again, you, you will get um, either way good quality data. It's also nice to see that this chemistry has been um, proven successful in the field. This is the same um, bioarchive paper from Luciano Martellotto and Jasmine Plummer that I mentioned before. In the second part of the, of the study, they, they generated a protocol to isolate nuclei from FFP blocks. And um, I, loved, I love the quote from Luciano here, where he say, well, a tweet, I should say, uh, where he said that the cure for cancer is now sitting in a pathologist's drawer. And so what they did was to isolate, uh, develop this protocol to isolate nuclei from FFP blocks. Um, and then they profiled the nuclei using the flex chemistry, and they also used a um, consecutive section that was profiled using um, Visium for FFP solution. And they found a very nice correlation in terms of gene expression, in terms of cell detected between the two technologies. So paraphrasing Luciano in my last bullet point, what I would say is this protocol or our protocol now really enables you to generate high quality and high sensitive single cell or single nuclear data starting from FFP tissues, which essentially now allows us to generate extensive retrospective uh, studies start, uh, using our um, um, archived um, sample. And uh, this essentially gives us the unique opportunity to do single cell or single nuclei and uh, uh, spatial transcriptomics starting from the very same tissue block. Um, which gives us really an unprecedented view of biology, and nobody else can do that. Um, and so, for instance, um, Luciano here, um, they integrated their single nuclear data with their spatial transcriptomics data, and by doing that, that's a strategy to increase the resolution of the spatial transcriptomics platform, but they were able to see, essentially, that the epithelial markers here, commonly expressed in the metastasis uh, tissue, those overlap with the metastasis um, uh, region of the tissue. Hepatocyte markers, those overlap well with the uh, healthy part of the tissue. And then they found ESR1 expression. And that is really interesting because um, this pa patient um, was originally a, a ESR1 positive. But then following therapy, she was, um, she, she basically, she became ESR1 negative. And this sample was supposed to be ESR1 negative, or at least when they uh, obtained this sample, that was supposed to be a triple negative um, cancer. And so ESR1 was not supposed to be expressed. But ESR1 was detected with the single cell data and also with the spatial transcriptomics data, which shows you, again, the, sens the incredible sensitivity of this technology, specificity, and also shows you that the typical uh, diagnostic method cannot really provide that level of sensitivity. Um, I leave you with uh, a paper um, that we, or manuscript that we recently um, released. Um, and uh, it's an example of how we use the entire 10X ecosystem to profile the same FFP tissue block. So this was a human breast cancer sample. Um, we cut a couple of scrolls and generated single cell data using FLEX and the uh, Chromium X. Then we took a consecutive section and generated uh, spatial transcriptomics data using the site assist. And then again, a consecutive section and generated in situ data um, using the Xenium analyzer um, and generated in situ data. And, uh, and that is really what we say, well, this is the ecosystem that really gives you an unprecedented view of biology because now you can use three different approaches, three different platforms to study just the same, very same tissue block, the same, same tissue sample. And I really recommend reading it. <laughs> um, now, the, in the last uh, two minutes, I wanted to briefly mention um, the cost saving or how much this um, solution costs. And um, keep in mind that what I'm showing you here are just 10x genomics, is that the cost of for 10x genomic re, uh, genomics reagents. So what I'm showing you here, um, it does not include any um, core fees or any sequencing um, or the cost for sequencing. It's just the cost of the kit. Okay? Um, so, and as a benchmark, I'm using the three prime chemistry, uh, the typical three prime chemistry. So, 
the cost per sample is about $1,600 with the three prime chemistry, a little bit more, and it's gonna go up starting January 1st. Um, a little bit up, it's gonna go a little bit up starting January 1st. Now, this is flex. And with flex, we have three, let's say three sides, four, three sides of the kit. The first one is what we call a four by one. Here is where you have four gel bits reaction and only one set of barcoded probes. So you will not be able to multiplex samples. This is the kit that you'll be using to run essentially four samples separately, one sample per lane. It costs 700, well, it's about $700, um, dollar per, uh, seven seventeen hundred dollars per uh, per sample, the price is not going to go up. Fix is not going to flex is not going to go up. Um, and so yes, it's a little bit expensive. Um, the, this difference will be a little bit lower because three prime is going to go up. But uh, it's a little bit expensive, more expensive than three prime. But think, keep in mind the increased sensitivity and increased flexibility with flex. Then we have what we call a four by four. So four gel bits, four sets of barcode that allows you to multiplex up to four different samples together in the same reaction, um, target 10,000 cells per sample, so there will be a total of 40,000 cells per gel bit reactions, and in total is essentially is a 16 reaction kit, pretty much. So now you see that when you run this kit uh, and you combine four samples together, the cost per sample is about $1,300. So now you're starting saving about $300 compared to the three prime or the five prime chemistry, the price is the same. Um, and then we have the four by 16. This is where you can, um, so four gel bits, 16 barcodes. This is where you can combine up to 16 samples together. Um, and it's a total of 64 reactions. Um, now you see that here, when you do take advantage of the, or full, full advantage of the kit and combine 16 samples, essentially each sample will cost you $550. And um, quoting one of these sequencing core director in my region, um, they basically mentioned that at this point, $550 per reaction is pretty much what you, we used to pay for bulk RNA sequencing just a couple of years ago. Um, again, this is just 10x genomics reagent cost. It doesn't include any other, it doesn't include sequencing, it doesn't include core um, fees. Um, there is even a larger um, uh, size of the kit in which we have 16 gel bits and 16 barcodes, so a total of 256 reactions. Um, that will reduce the cost per sample down to $380, 280 and change. I believe it's $280, $285 per, per sample. So we can really um, go down in, um, in terms of um, cost per sample. And so I'm hoping I was able to show you that we are kind of at an inflection point now where I strongly believe that flex will become the new standard, the new gold standard for single cell RNA sequencing. And that's because of this superior sensitivity, its flexibility, again, we can run anything between one sample and 128 samples per chip or up to a million cell per run. Um, the type of sample we can fix, again, we can fix many different type of sample, we can store them, and we don't need to worry about cell viability anymore once samples are fixed. That gives us a lot of, really a lot of uh, peace of mind and um, flexibility. Uh, when you do multiplex sample is where you'll be able really to save money and save time um, and, uh, and also reduce any potential batch effect, um, maximize your, um, the sample, uh, the, the, the way you want to perhaps run um, biological replicates, for instance. And then it's really the only chemistry that you can use to do uh, RNA sequences starting from FFP um, samples. And so in conclusion, what I would say is that our goal here is really to provide you with an ecosystem that enables you to do fantastic research. Um, we, are, we have been spending a lot of time and effort to make sure that those three platforms are very, very well integrated together and can work on as many sample types as possible. Um, and uh, we have also incredible resources um, that really are there to help you and make sure you're gonna be successful. Uh, su successful. And so we really wanna have We'll start having a conversation with you, starting even here before sample prep, when you, when you start thinking about designing your experiment, setting up your, your project, and then we can go through sample prep all the way down to data analysis. We have a resource for all of that. So 
My, what, what I want to say is our goal is really to make sure you're going to be successful. So don't hesitate to reach out at any time point, at any time um, we are really here to, to help you. Um, I'll leave you with this slide and yeah, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any question and happy holidays if we don't see each other again before the end of the year. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Egan, I have a question. So at the end of November, um, Junko Genomics announced that a partnership with 10X Genomics. Oh. The CRISPR clean assay, which they are advertising being compatible with the three prime single cell RNA assay, will that also be compatible with Flux? And what sort mm. of part? What does this partnership really mean between Junko Genomics? And right. Tenex? Right now, good question. So I, I don't, I don't think is probably it's not gonna. I, for, for what I know, I don't think it's compatible with Flex at least as of now. Um, I would probably need to think about that if it would be compatible. I mean, this is probe based, so um, and we didn't include um, with probe with this set of probe. We didn't include a bunch of genes that don't add. Any user for information success. There are no probes for ribosomal proteins genes. There are some probes for mitochondrial genes that we use for a QC purpose, um, um, for QC in the data essentially. Uh, and there are no genes for TCR. So that might not be the case for jump code for for flex. Um, I think it's more relevant, definitely more relevant with three prime or five prime. Um, regarding your second. Second question, um, you know, I'm not sure actually um, what that, what that um, really entails um, in terms of partnership. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I, can, I can find more information and share it with you. Uh, if you have a specific question, you know, or if you wanna know how to use their product with our library, I can definitely find more information, but um, it's not something that I, I've come across very often, yeah. Yes? Uh, are there any tools in the work to support custom probe design for Oh, that's a good, yeah, good question. No, not, no. Uh, there are not, but we're gonna um, release a tech note. Um, don't ask me when, please, but <laughs> um, if it happens before the end of 2022, I'll be, um, I'd be extremely happy, might be 2023 anyway. Um, so we're gonna release this tech note in which we're gonna provide some guidelines or recommendation on how to um, spike in custom probes. Uh, but in terms of having a tool to design those probes, not that I know of. Um, there, are, there is, um, in the meantime, if there is interest in that, I, what I will say is, um, let me know, I'll pass this information to our, to our team. And um, there is also a paper um, in which the authors sp spiked in pro custom probes. Um, that is on Visium for FFP. So it's not exactly you know, single cell uh, flex, but the, the method is similar. It's similar enough that we can think about perhaps using that paper as a starting point and then you know, using the tech note as soon as that becomes available. Yeah. Um, yep. <clears throat> sorry, first question. If looking for a rare cell population within a tissue sample, is it best to store the tissue in flex buffer and then dissociate later? Or perform the enrichment first yeah. and then fix the It's a good question. So um, what I would say is uh, if, it, it might, it depends on, I would say it depends on the sample, depends on the frequency of those rare cells. Um, if we need to do fact sorting because the uh, the cell population is um, fairly very rare or um, sufficiently rare that we do need to do uh, sorting, uh, my recommendation would be to uh, dissociate the tissue, sort the cells, and then if we have enough cells, uh, fix the cells in uh, um, in the flex but in the uh, in the, the fixative. Um, the we don't recommend sorting um, fixed cells. Um, 
simply because we don't do that in-house. Um, not saying that it's not possible, but we don't really have experience on that. Um, I know that there are, a, at least BioLegend has some antibodies that they claim they work with uh, fi uh, fixed um, cells, but it, it will need to be tested. And so in that case, I would say it really depends on um, how many cells we are talking about, um, what the final number of cells is, what the frequency is, but um, one avenue will be one possible avenue would be dissociate the tissue, sort the cells. If we have enough cells, we do that and then we fix them. Yeah. Um, I, you went over the gene coverage earlier, but I, but I do recall that it's been about 300 to 400 genes for the single cell RNA-seq. Do you have correlation of what the sensitivity would be to compare transcript numbers from bulk RNA-seq so I'm not sure about the 300 to 400 genes with the three primate. Um, when that happens, typically is an indication that the sample was dead or dying or anyway, was the sample was compromised. We don't typically, we don't see only 300 genes per cell. Um, that is an indication, that's an indication that the, sam the sample quality was poor, was very, was, was, was bad. Um, so for a, for a typical healthy sample, we can see any, anything between 800 to 7,000, 8,000 genes, depending on the sample type, depending on sequencing depth. Um, so that I will probably, probably we need to talk, um, we, need, we need to have a conversation because I like to understand a little bit better um, why there were only 300 genes per cell. Um, and because that definitely it's a it's not a common scenario, um, and when that again when that happens is because there is typically an issue with the with sample quality. Um, bulk RNA sequencing? No, I don't think we have any correlation with bulk RNA sequencing. Um, it's not it's hard to compare it because they're really uh, two significantly different um, approaches. Um, I don't think we typically compare, even with three prime, chemistry or five prime, we don't typically compare the number of genes that you detect with bulk um, and single cell. Um, again, uh, and, and once again, the number of cell that you, the number of genes that you detected with single cell depends on the type of sample and sequence in depth. So, but uh, we don't, I don't believe we have any correlation with bulk RNA sequencing. I don't believe we run any bulk RNA sequencing. Yeah. Um, so right now we have the mouse and the human prophase approach for the flex. Do we have any plan to release other species yeah. in the near future? So good, yeah, good question. Uh, um, it's, we, I, not, I'm not aware of any, anything in the pipeline. Or um, That doesn't mean that there is no plan. It means that we, I, don't, um, I don't have visibility or um, I haven't been told that any plan about releasing probes for, let's say, non-human primate, it can be rhesus macaque or rats. Uh, what I would say is, if there is interest in using um, flex on uh, species other than human and mouse, and I've been having this conversation more than uh, already, um, more than once with, with customers, um, it, it would be good if we could connect uh, and, um, and see, uh, see what, we, uh, what species we, we would like to profile. Um, and in the meantime, we pass the information uh, to our internal team. Um, and, um, and of course, there is, there is always, there is always the, the, avenue, the, the possibility of designing custom probes. Um, that is something that um, can be done. Um, we know the structure of the probes. We can pretty much um, share the structure of the probes. We cannot share the concentration of the probes. Um, but that is where the optimization will, will start. Sure. All right. Yep. If there are any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, as I said, um, I'll be more than happy to share the, the slide with, with you all. Oh. Yes, there's one more. So sorry. Oh.
Thank you. <laughs> so sorry, Dan. No worries. How many cells do you capture if not multiplexing the samples? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mention that. that good point. Um, so you can, you can capture, you can still capture up to 10,000 cells per um, channel or per sample um, when you multiplex it. Um, it's 10,000, yeah. And um, yeah, I, did, I didn't mention that. So single plex samples, that would be 10,000 cells per sample. If you multiplex up to four samples together, that is still 10,000 cells per sample. If you multiplex six, 16 samples together, that goes down a little bit, is 8,000 cells per sample. Okay, so thank you to 10X for coming today to give this seminar to tell us a little bit more about the technology that's evolving. And I would like to say, if you have any questions following this, please reach out to 10X and the Gene Expression Center. We'd be happy to set up a meeting with you to discuss your interest in the 10X platforms, whether it be on the single cell side with fresh or fixed um, access to our new chromium, not the new, to our older chromium controller, independent access to that, what you need to do in order to be able to do that, or to learn more about the services that we have available. So thank you very much and happy holidays to everyone.